Hi doctors, it's me, Pearl. In this video, we will be discussing rationale for some of the AMC questions as presented in Amadex and M plus X Q banks. We highly recommend that you avail any of these to help you build up on your theoreticals and improve your testmanship as well. You can check the websites of Amadex or M plus X and check their subscriptions. Starting off with the first question. A 32-year-old woman, who has just recently migrated from Somali to Australia, presents to your practice with complaint of severe anal pain, particularly on defecation, for the past three months. She mentions that at times she notices blood streaking her stool or dripping in the toilet bowl after a painful bowel movement. Examination, along with the history, confirms the diagnosis of anal fissure. Which one of the following options is the most expected predisposing factor for this presentation in this patient? A. Rectal cancer. Hemorrhoids. C. Perianal abscess. D. Rectal schistosomiasis. E. A. High fiber diet. Take note the pertinence in this case. Given the fact that the patient is an immigrant from Somali, where schistosomiasis is endemic, rectal schistosomiasis is most likely to have predisposed to the anal fissure and such presentation. Schistosomiasis is either intestinal or urogenital, depending on where the adult flukes are located. In intestinal schistosomiasis, adult worms occupy mesenteric veins, and their eggs pass into the lumen of the intestine and reach the feces. Option A. Given the patient is young and has anal fissure, rectal cancer is unlikely to be the predisposing factor to this presentation. It can cause altered bowel motions and bleeding. Anal fissures are not a feature of rectal cancer though. Hemorrhoids, option B, present with painless rectal bleeding, and there is no pain on defecation. Although chronic constipation can be a predisposing factor for both hemorrhoids and anal fissure, hemorrhoids do not cause anal fissure. Perianal abscesses, option C can present with painful or tender swellings around the anus. Although they might cause pain on defecation as the feces passes and compresses an abscess, they do not cause rectal bleeding or anal fissure. Perianal fistulae, however, can develop as a consequent of perianal abscess. High fiber diet, option E do not predispose to anal fissure. It is actually a management step in both hemorrhoids and anal fissures. Next question. During your night shift in a rural hospital in Northern Territory, you receive a 27-year-old man 30 minutes after being bitten by a brown snake in the left ankle. Upon arrival, he has no symptoms. On examination, you notice scratches over the left ankle, but no fong marks are present. The nearest tertiary hospital is 150 kilometers away. Which one of the following is the most appropriate next step in management of this patient? A. Discharge him home because he is asymptomatic and there is no fong mark indicating a bite. B. Air transfer him to the tertiary hospital. C. Give him a vial of antivenom now and another if symptoms develop. D. Application of a tourniquet above the bite site. E. Give him a vial of antivenom once he starts developing the symptoms. This is a case of a snake bite, and different states have their own guidelines, like that of the South Australian and New South Wales. Take note that this setting is in a rural area, and a different algorithm should be followed in country hospitals. According to the guidelines in South Australia, if a suspected snake bite presents in the hospital, one must put a PBI in place first. PBI, or pressure bandage with immobilization. Proper PBI should be a broad elasticized bandage, not a crepe bandage. The bandage is applied over the bite site and then distally to proximally covering the whole limb. The limb and whole patient should be immobilized for the first aid to be effective. This should remain until the patient has been transferred and assessed in hospital. The bandage should only be removed if antivenom is available and after there is no evidence of envenoming based on the admission laboratory tests and clinical examination. If the patient is envenomed the bandage can be removed after antivenom has been administered. Next. If that facility has no capacity to do so, then the patient must immediately be transferred to the nearest tertiary hospital. Next is to determine whether the patient has indications for antivenom administration. These are the following.
Next is to do initial assessment, including gaining access for intravenous administration and conduction of diagnostics. Reassessment then follows. In this case, PBI should be done first as a first aid. However, it is not among the choices. D. Application of tourniquet is wrong. A. Discharging the patient is wrong as this patient requires observation. B. Assuming that this rural hospital has no capacity for definitive management, then the most appropriate next step is to transfer him to the tertiary hospital. The answer is B. C. This patient is not currently presenting with paralysis, excessive bleeding, change in sensorium, oliguria, anuria, or myoglinuria, which are the signs of envenomation, so C is wrong. E. May be correct, but this should not delay the urgent transfer of patient. Next question. A five-year-old child is brought to your clinic with complaint of cough. His mother explains that the cough started two months ago and sometimes wakes him up at night. He also has them when he plays with other children or runs and sometimes is associated with small amount of clear phlegm. On history, you realize that he had flexural eczema when he was two years old. Their child is afebrile. On chest examination, no wheeze is heard. The rest of the physical exam is inconclusive. Which one of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Epiglottitis. B. Chronic sinusitis. C. Asthma. D. Gastroesophageal reflux disease. E. Whooping cough. The age of the child, history of atopy, eczema, and chronic intermittent cough favor the diagnosis of asthma. Option A. Epiglottis has more pronounced and acute presentation with fever and cough, respiratory distress, and drooling. The child is usually very ill. Option B. Chronic sinusitis may present with nocturnal cough caused by post-nasal drip, but exertional cough is not usually a feature. Besides, the discharges tend to be more thick and purulent. There is also history of facial tenderness or fullness and recurrent upper respiratory infections. Option D. Gastroesophageal reflux is rare in this age group. If present, it may cause chronic cough and mimic cough variant asthma especially at night, but not exertional cough. Moreover, absence of other features such as heartburn makes this diagnosis far less unlikely. Option E. Whooping cough, pertussis, has a different presentation with paroxysms of cough and the terminal inspiratory whoop. Next question. A 69-year-old woman presents to your clinic with complaint of vaginal discharge. As a part of workup you perform a urine PCR test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. The result is positive for gonorrhea. You tell her about the results and that gonorrhea is a sexually transmissible disease. She mentions that she has not had any sexual relationship with anyone whatsoever. Which one of the following will be the next best step in management? A. Repeat the PCR test. B. Give a single dose of ceftriaxone. C. Give a single dose of azithromycin. D. Arrange for hysteroscopy. E. Counsel her about treatment. Currently, a nucleic acid amplification test or NAAT such as PCR is recommended as the optimal method for the diagnosis of genital tract infections caused by Neisseria gonorrhea and Chlamydia trachomatis. Samples for knots can be collected from vagina or endocervix, urine for both male and female, or urethra for only men. Compared with culture, commercially available knots offer rapid results and are generally more sensitive than culture. The main drawback of NAAT is the fact that no antibiotic susceptibility is provided. Cultures are only recommended when drug resistance is suspected. In situations where positive test results are not supported by sexual history or clinical findings, retesting the patient with a different NAAT or culture is recommended. Patients should be counseled about prompt treatment after a positive screening test because an additional test might be falsely negative. Since the treatment of chlamydia trachomatis and Neisseria gonorrhea is safe and relatively inexpensive, 
the patient might choose to be treated empirically without further testing or wait for the repeated test result. The answer is E, counsel her about treatment. Based on the Australian guidelines, the recommended treatment for gonorrhea is ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. Alternative treatments are not recommended. While the recommended treatment for chlamydia is doxycycline. While the alternative is azithromycin. An 82-year-old man male presents to the emergency department with a knife in his hand. He claims that he hears voices saying his neighbors want to kill him and he should kill them before they kill him. You, as the attending physician, manage to verbally de-escalate him and convince him to surrender his knife. Which one of the following would be the next best step in management? A. Call the police. B. Call the hospital security. C. Call his family to help you with dealing with him. D. Calm him down and talk to him. E. Offer him tea and biscuit. The presentation is typical of acute psychosis and command hallucinations. Any patient with command hallucinations to harm self or others is at significant risk of developing violence sooner or later. Although apparently this patient is ready to surrender his knife now, with command hallucinations he may still pose risk to himself or others. Under circumstances such as this one, calling the hospital security would be the next best step in management. This will ensure the safety of you and the staff while you are planning further measures. Option A, calling the police was an appropriate option if this situation happened in the community and not in a medical facility. Option C, calling his family will provide an opportunity to obtain more information about his medical and psychiatric history, however, security and safety comes first. Option D, verbal de-escalation to calm the patient or measures to establish rapport such as offering tea and biscuits is appropriate only after the threat is eliminated or controlled. Next question. A 65-year-old man presents with an exquisitely painful vesicular rash, which has been present for the past seven days and is increasingly painful. The rash is shown in the accompanying photograph. His past medical history is unremarkable. Physical examination is otherwise inconclusive. Which one of the following is the most appropriate immediate management? A. Oral phenergan, promethazine. B. Intravenous famciclovir. C. Intramuscular immunoglobulin. D. Oral famciclovir. E. Oral amitriptyline. The appearance of the rash as well as the history is suggestive of herpes zoster or shingles infection as the most likely diagnosis. Shingles usually occurs in adults. Pain is a significant complaint in patients with shingles. Promethazine is not effective for pain control in shingles. Antiviral agents such as famciclovir, valaciclovir or acyclovir should be used in any patient seen within 72 hours of the onset of vesicles, all patients with ophthalmic herpes zoster, and in immunocompromised patients. Varicella zoster immunoglobulin and vaccine are used for prophylaxis. Their use is not effective in treatment or for pain control after the infection has established. Tricyclic antidepressants and the anticonvulsant gabapentin are the most effective medications for pain control in neuropathic pain associated with shingles. The answer is E. Next question. Which one of the following is not a contraindication to vaginal delivery in breach presentation at term? A. Clinically inadequate pelvis. B. Footling breach presentation. C. Anemia. D. Placenta previa. E. Estimated fetal weight greater than 3,800 grams. Vaginal breach delivery may be offered provided that there are no contraindications to vaginal delivery. These include Placenta previa, contracted pelvis, cord presentation Prior cesarean deliveries Fetal anomalies that may cause dystocia Estimated fetal weight less than 2,500 grams and greater than 3,800 grams Gestational age less than 36 weeks 
hyperextension of the fetal head. Incomplete breach presentation. Anticipated mechanical difficulty. Anemia is not a contraindication to vaginal delivery for breach presentation. Which one of the following is not associated with prolongation of QD interval? A. Hypothyroidism. B. Methadone. C. Sotolol. D. Hypercalcemia. E. Haloperidol. Option A. Hypothyroidism is usually associated with hypocalcemia, and serum calcium level is inversely proportional to the QD interval. Hence, A is correct. Methadone, sotolol, and haloperidol all cause QD prolongation. I lifted this from USMLE Step 1. Agents that prolong QD interval include the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E, F. A. For antiarrhythmics. B for antibiotics like macrolides, fluoroquinolones. C for antipsychotics. D for antidepressants. E for antiemetics. And F for antifungals. D. Hypercalcemia is incorrect. It actually causes shortened QD interval. Here's the comparison for each. Last question for this set of QBank. A 22-year-old Aboriginal man is in the waiting list for kidney transplant due to end-stage renal disease. In the meanwhile, he is on dialysis three times a week. He has presented to you as his treating physician and says he does not want to undergo dialysis and wants to withdraw from treatment. Which one of the following would be the most appropriate action to take? A. Arrange for a donor for him. B. Ignore his wish and treat him. C. Arrange a family meeting. D. Discuss his decision with him to make sure he understands the consequences. E. Refer the case to the court. Patient autonomy is the cornerstone of all healthcare ethics. Every competent adult has the absolute right to do what they desire with their own health and life. When a patient decides not to accept or withdraw from a treatment, the most appropriate next step is always a full discussion with the patient about the potential consequences of his, her decision and making sure that they understand them. So much so, that this patient is an Aboriginal who may have other issues that need to be addressed first, including miscommunication issues. Most institutions in Australia have Aboriginal liaisons from whom we can seek help. The answer is D. Option A. Arranging for a donor just because he does not want to go on with the treatment is not appropriate. Option B. Ignoring a competent patient's expressed wish and acting differently is an act of battery and punishable by the law. Option C and E. Arranging a family meeting for discussion about a competent patient's wish is not appropriate. Neither is referring the case to the court because the law is quite straightforward on this matter. Thank you doctors for watching. I hope we are able to provide you concise rationale for each question. Study well.